when we look at America, we're going to talk more about America next week. So I don't want to spend too much time about the actual revolution. But what I what I do want to talk about today is just some of the symbology that we see with America. Here you see And by that he means he's just gonna whine about symbols because they don't fit his worldview. Whine, whine, whine. Here you see the East pediment of the US Supreme Court. And there you'll see Solon right next to Moses and Confucius. Jesus, by the way, is not on this list of lawgivers. He doesn't count according to the Supreme Court or the U.S., but Moses does, and Solon does. And there's Solon, who is the very first one to write a constitution in the West. Well, maybe that's because Jesus is more of a Messiah figure than a lawgiver. He's a figure that fulfills the law rather than gives laws. But hey, you have your Moses there, so what are you whining about? Uh, here you see, ironically, Libertas. <sighs> no, my friend, that's Columbia. The personification of America. Yes, Columbia is also associated with Liberty, but she's not the same as Libertas. Libertas and Columbia are two different goddesses. Honestly, we're not even a minute in the video and it already gets a major fact wrong. Not off to a good start, my friend. Where does Libertas sit? Well, Libertas, who was the Roman goddess of Liberty, sits where? Well, she sits atop the U.S. Capitol building. Well, that's kind of strange, isn't it? She's, uh, uh, suddenly coming back, she's got that crown on her head with stars. Hmm, that sounds similar, doesn't it? Uh, similar to something we see in Revelation 12, doesn't it? A woman with stars around her head. Uh, interesting. <sighs> the woman from Revelation 12 represents the Virgin Mary, genius. And yes, there's also an interpretation that says that woman represents the very nation of Israel. You know, with the 12 stars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, for some reason, so many Christians seem to think that that woman from Revelation, you know, the one who's crowned with the 12 stars and standing on the moon and clothed with the sun, some Christians seem to think that woman represents a pagan goddess. No, no, no. That woman does not represent a pagan goddess. The woman of the apocalypse represents the Virgin Mary and the nation of Israel. You know, I don't understand why so many Christians think this. Heck, I'm a freaking pagan and I know this. She's carrying a book, of course, and a wreath. Uh, this is Libertas atop our U.S. Capitol building. In fact, if you go into the Capitol Visitor Center, you'll find this particular statue of Libertas as well. Uh, it's a plaster model here, the goddess of liberty. There she is, holding her book with her stars on her head. Okay, again, that's Columbia, not Libertas. And she's holding a wreath and a shield, a shield. She is not even holding a book. So at the top of the Capitol Dome, you have Libertas right at the very top. Well, when you go into the Capitol Dome and you go into the rotunda and then you look up, you're going to see this really beautiful painting at the very top of the dome. And this is what is known as the apotheosis of Washington, the apotheosis of Washington. Let's go ahead and zoom in. And you can see here that there is the painting of Mr. George Washington holding a sword here. He's dressed in purple draped in purple, which is a royal color, by the way. And he has a rainbow arch that he's sitting atop. And then he's flanked by a couple of different goddesses. He has Victoria here on his left. And sure enough, right here on his right, holding that book we just saw is Libertas. And he's pointing at her book. So this is in the rotunda, looking up at the Capitol Dome. Here is George Washington surrounded by goddesses. Here's down below, below him is Columbia. She's also a very important goddess in America. Very, very important. You can think about the District of Columbia, right? Literally, the D.C. is named after her. So we're not going to go into all of these gods. But when you look up, you'll see that George Washington, and of course, the apotheosis of Washington is the idea he has gone to the heavens. He, he's gone to the heavens in an exalted manner. Um, and he is now surrounded in heaven by all of these figures, Libertas, Minerva, Columbia, uh, Mercury, Venus, Neptune. I mean, this is somewhat strange. And it's strange that you don't see Jesus Christ there, isn't it? There's no image of Jesus Christ, nothing about anything to do with Christianity whatsoever, right? Oh, well, maybe that's because the world doesn't revolve around Christianity. And yes, our founding fathers were inspired by the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome. In fact, they actually based our country around these civilizations. 
And there's nothing wrong with that! And oh, so you admit you know that's Columbia! Honestly, my friend, did you not recognize Columbia from atop the capital? Huh? These are all pre-Christian gods that are associated with the rise to heaven by George Washington. Here's a $5 bill uh, from 1862 uh, with Libertas on it. There she is with her stars at the top of her head. It's a $5 note. This is justice. And what she's doing is she's recording the voice of the people guided by light, liberty, and truth. Here you see Libertas up here, Lux, which is the uh, Latin word for light, Et, which is the Latin word for and, and Veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. So liberty, light, and truth. And here is, of course, the eagle was always by the side of Jupiter, which was the god of Rome. So anytime you saw Jupiter, you would see the eagle. He was always by his side. So America adopted the eagle, and the eagle, of course, was the icon of Rome, ancient Rome. So again, not a lot of Christian symbology here, right? Lots instead of pagan Greco-Roman philosophy and uh, ideas here. Yes, that's because the world doesn't revolve around Christianity. The world does not revolve around your beliefs. And yes, the Founding Fathers were inspired by the classical civilizations of Greece and Rome. Our Founding Fathers were fond of comparing our new republic to the ancient Roman Republic. So yes, they chose the eagle as our national bird. Huh. The eagle is a very fitting symbol for our country, is it not? <laughs> and honestly, my friend, are you blind? There's Christian symbols everywhere! There's a church on every corner! Everywhere you look, there's a Christian symbol! There's a cross! There's an image of Jesus and the Virgin Mary! There's Christian symbols all over America! Is that not enough for you? So here you have Libertas, of course, standing in the New York Harbor. Uh, there she is again. There's the seven spikes on top of the head of Lady Liberty. And very similar, by the way, to even to the another god in Rome called Sol Invictus. Just lots of strange things here that we find as we go deeper into this topic. And as I said, our founding fathers were inspired by the Greco-Roman ideals. And they built our country up based on these ideas. And our country became the strongest, most prosperous country on the earth because of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing strange about it. Oh, our founding fathers were inspired by pagan Greco-Roman civilization. Oh, our founding father used Greco-Roman symbols. Oh, how dare they? Oh, come on. I also was kicking around on a website just a week or two ago, and I was looking at the Congressional Medals of Honor. And the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard all have a Medal of Honor, the Congressional Medal of Honor that they give. And the one for the uh, Air Force has the picture of the Statue of Liberty on the front of the Congressional Medal of Honor. They don't change these, by the way, out of respect for the recipients. So these have been looked like this for years and years and years, decades and decades. And you'll notice what it says right here on the actual website from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. It says the Statue of Liberty is centered in the Air Force design. In addition to standing for liberty, she is derived from the imagery of Queen Semiramis of Babylon, who was famed for her beauty, strength, and wisdom. So again, not even just a throwback to Libertas. We know Libertas is even kind of a personification of something that's even earlier, right? Babylon had their own versions of gods, uh, as did the Sumerians and all of these ancient cultures. Egypt had their own. And so all of this is just kind of derived from all of these ancient pagan gods. And here you have the Statue of Liberty, according to the Congressional Medal of Honor website, being connected to Semiramis, who we know is a very pagan, pagan queen from Babylon. You know, in all honesty, I did find that kind of strange. I could not find a single connection between Semiramis and the Statue of Liberty. Although many Christians try to connect the Statue of Liberty with this woman, Semiramis, well, cause mostly because many Christians believe that Semiramis invented paganism or something. <sighs> I'm going to make a video about Semiramis sometime in the future. Ha, <sighs> but that is kind of ironic, because many Christians are just obsessed with Semiramis. <laughs> Interesting stuff, to say the least. Now, you can get more into this topic of America's counterfeit goddess of liberty, uh, more about Libertas and Democratia, uh, by going to truerichesradio.com forward slash Libertas. We have a teaching there that you can 
see that. Spoiler alert, I'm debunking that video next. But I, I want to really stress something to you here now, because now we've seen all of these different gods related to America, Greece, and Rome. But one thing I think that as Americans we forget is that these were actually pointed out by the prophet Daniel. Uh, Rome and Greece were two of the four beasts that were going to do what? They were going to threaten and oppress God's chosen people. And so we know that Greece and Rome are two of those governments, right? We have Babylon, which was the, looked like a lion. We have the bear, which was Medo-Persia. We have the leopard, four-headed leopard, which was uh, the Greece. And then we have this really strange beast that doesn't look like some of the other ones called Rome. These are the four beasts that Daniel says, these kingdoms, they're going to oppress and threaten God's chosen people, right? Remember that the stone that is cut without hands in Daniel chapter two, verse 44, it comes and strikes the feet of the statue. Now, the feet of the statue is connected to Rome, right? Well, when we look in America, what do we see? We see Rome revived. We see the Roman goddess Libertas revived. We see the Roman, the ancient pagan Roman ideals of uh, democracy uh, and liberty. All of these things now being shown to us as being something that God wants us to have. You see, God wants us to have the form of government, we're told, that came into the mind of the ancient Greeks who were trying to oppress God's chosen people. Oh, so that's what you're trying to argue. <laughs> No, my friend, you are not being oppressed. Christians in America are not being oppressed. And heck, how could you guys be oppressed? You're the overwhelming majority. And honestly, why would God need a chosen people? Honestly, why would the God who supposedly created all human beings have a chosen people? That sounds like a parent having their favorite child. But it does make you think. Why would your God give the Greeks and the Romans the superior system? I mean, even people who study the influence of Hellenism upon the Jews in the lead up to the time of Christ know that Hellenism was an, a powerful force that was destructive to Judaism. Uh, the philosophies that the Apostle Paul is writing about in the New Testament are Greco-Roman philosophies that he's warning the people about. So... The fact that these went away and then they came back and that the Lord has not yet come tells us that perhaps this is the war upon the saints, that this is the war upon the saints. Those same governments that went away are now back with a vengeance, right? But in a new way, in a mystery way, in a way that was not foreseen, in a way that was not understood. Think about the quote here from Mark chapter two, where Jesus says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. So what many people wanna tell us today is that God's kingdom, he searched all throughout all of the different governments, and he chose to give us the pagan Greco-Roman government of Greece and Rome, and that's what he chose to give us, right? He gave that to us. We're told that we're, we were given this, that Christians were so good that God gave us pagan Rome and Greece as our reward, right? That we are given Democratia because Democratia was so good, right? Remember, these are pre-Christian ideas, by the way. These were ideas that were pre-Christian. So when Christ comes, the, the founders of America are literally, let's go back before Jesus to find our organizing principles for government. They don't want anything post-Christ. They don't want to have to deal with that. They want to go back pre-Christ to find their organizing principles for government. We're going to talk about that next week. But you have to ask, would it be right to put the new wine of the kingdom into these old wineskins of pagan Greco-Roman uh, philosophies and values and beliefs and traditions? Is that is that what we're really expecting here? Should we really believe that? Oh, indeed. Yes. Because let me explain something to you, my friend. The people who are fleeing from Europe to the Americas were fleeing religious persecution, right? They were fleeing from the Christian theocracies of Europe. You see, the, you see, the theocracies of Europe were persecuting people because they did not follow the state religion. So people fled from Europe, from these theocracies, and fled to America for religious freedom. And yes, our founding fathers were inspired by the classical governments. They were inspired by the 
a democracy of Athens and the Republic of Rome. And they wanted to implement the, those forms of government into this new country. And when they looked at the theocracies of Europe, they saw that the Christian theocracies of Europe have failed. They failed. So our founding fathers experimented with democracy. And well, look how this country turned out. We turned out to be the most prosperous and free country on the planet. We would have never reached those levels of freedom and prosperity if we just became a Christian theocracy. The Christian theocracies have failed, and democracy has succeeded. That tells you a lot, huh, my friend? And really, who is saying that your god gave us this system? Who? Who's saying this? I never heard anyone say this. Let's listen to John Adams. He wrote a book, a very interesting book. And here's a little quote from it. He says, the United States of America have exhibited perhaps the first example of governments erected on the simple principles of nature. He brags about it. And if men are now sufficiently enlightened, there's that word, to disabuse themselves of artifice, imposture, hypocrisy, and superstition, right? Read belief in the Trinity. Re, uh, he's referring here, of course, to belief that Jesus is the son of God, which he didn't believe. He, uh, he's referring here to the belief that Jesus... Uh, died upon the cross, was buried, and was resurrected from the dead. This is what he's calling superstition. Uh, the idea that uh, Jesus was born to a virgin, this is what he's calling superstition. So don't think that he's talking about something else. He's talking about the core principles of Christianity. It's not just Christianity. He is saying that the royalty and the nobility have no more of a divine right to rule than the common people. He's saying that the, the, royal, the royalty has no more of a divine inspiration than the common men. Christianity is not the only religion that says the monarchs have a divine right to rule. John Adams is saying that the common people have a right to rule themselves. They will consider this event as an era in their history. It will never be pretended that any persons employed in that service had any interviews with the gods or were in any degree under the inspiration of heaven, any more than those at work upon ships or houses or laboring in merchandise or agriculture. It will forever be acknowledged that these governments were contrived merely by the use of reason and the senses. Okay, that's Mr. John Adams. I know that there's a lot of people today who are trying to make John Adams a believer in the Trinity, uh, a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, born of a virgin, Jesus Christ being resurrected, Jesus coming back. I know there's people who try to do that. And, and why they try to do that, you have to ask, why are they trying to do that? Why are they trying to make the root good? And, but they keep complaining about the fruit, right? If you're going to complain about the fruit, well, then go back and examine the root. We'll read more about the founders next week. I mean, they have lots of nasty things to say about the apostles. And you just don't typically hear those in the Christian America curriculums that are out there. Anyway, this, by the way, is a quote from history of the principal republics in the world. And he wrote a defense of the constitutions of government in the United States of America by going back and looking at all the various republics of the past. Yes, and those pagan systems are the ones that triumphed, where the Christian theocracies utterly failed. <laughs> well, that's the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. And please, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.